Welcome, everybody, to the Primetime Podcast hosted here on the MEG Nick YouTube channel. My name is Nick, and I hope you guys are doing well whenever you are checking out this latest episode of the podcast. This is episode number 13 for you guys, and it is going to be the first one of the new year here, 2022. Hopefully you guys had a good holiday season here if you celebrated Christmas or New Year's or whatever you did over the last couple of weeks here. I took a break from uploading, as many of you guys knew, uh, just to spend some time with my friends and family and kind of relax over the holidays, which was a lot of fun. But we are back on the grind here for the channel, and we are about to produce so much great content for the upcoming year, of course. Uh, tons of big new shows and returning shows for the channel here. Uh, we got some great collabs going, big tournaments, big, big projects in the works here as well as new episodes of the podcast, which is what we are going to start off with today here. And for this episode, uh, we're kind of taking it back to uh, a bit of a retrospective of sorts. Some stuff that we want to see continue for 2022 in the world of TV, of course. Lots of good stuff that uh, started over the last couple of years, some trends that are recently evolving in the world of TV that I think generally are a positive out aspect to TV and the community surrounding it, as well as some things that are trendy now or things that uh, in the discourse of TV you might hear people bring up that I think are generally negative that we want to see improve or change going forward into 2022 as well. So we're going to break down a few things that I think are positive and a few things that I think are negative here going forward, as well as at the end, we'll talk about some of my biggest uh, anticipated TV shows for the upcoming season as well here and that'll be kind of a bonus towards the end of this video. Let's start off though by talking about some of the negative aspects that I've seen pop up every once in a while here uh, throughout the more recent years of TV in the discourse and the community surrounding it. Maybe these are things that TV networks or channels are doing as well here that I don't think are very helpful or, or you know positive for the overall sort of community here. Just kind of give off uh, sort of a negative energy uh, when people bring these up or when discussions are brought up surrounding this. And we're going to start off with probably the biggest one that you see uh, pop up within the uh, TV spheres as far as what networks are trying to implement into their more recent shows here, and that is politics. Uh, this is something that we've talked about plenty of times on the podcast before, but every time I say this, like, I just, you know, we need to put this out there and have some direct conversation about our role as TV audiences and what we're doing to kind of, uh, you know, fuel this flame of sorts and what TV networks are kind of taking notice of. Uh, of course, there's been many shows in the past couple of years here, most notably stuff like the Wonder Years reboot we've talked about before, the most recent season of Blackish we've talked about before, uh, certain episodes of uh, some crime dramas or stuff like that, like Law and Order as well, that implement politics in a really sloppy, really kind of mishapped way of sorts, um, whether it's race issues or stuff like COVID as well, uh, that are just kind of being forcefully implemented into the right writing of these shows in a way that just doesn't feel very, you know, genuine or very organic in that sense. And it just kind of alienates a lot of people who just don't want to see that when they're trying to relax and kind of get away from the real world by, you know, trying to watch uh, their favorite TV shows. And one of the biggest sort of reasons as to why this is so common now is because of cable news, of course, being so popular as it is. We've talked about this again prior uh, in previous episodes here, but uh, it's hosts like Tucker Carlson, for instance, like Rachel Maddow, who shows on MSNBC or Fox News or wherever are extremely popular, sometimes even being more so in the ratings than some of your standard TV shows against the primetime networks there. And it's just kind of upsetting to see how many people will choose to watch someone like that who is very controversial and, and very one-sided and obviously stuck in sort of their own bubble uh, in regards to their own opinions and thoughts uh, when it comes to these very political issues of sorts. And then these networks kind of implementing those same concepts and those same tropes into their shows. It just makes for a really kind of disconnected sort of, uh, you know, entertainment sphere of sorts. Uh, people being obviously very divided right now is not helping that situation anymore. 
than it already is. So let's just forget about that, right? 2022, we want to see politics go away, right? We want pure entertainment and uh, go back to the way it was, right? I sound like an old boomer <laughs> talking like that, but uh, that's my biggest complaint right now as far as uh, some of these writing, uh, some of these writers, excuse me, kind of implementing these things that are just not really doing it for the mainstream audience there. Uh, let's talk about another thing that I see a lot of the time here with the networks behind uh, some of these actions and some of these behaviors that they do. This is something that I started taking notice of uh, in the last few weeks, actually. But the more I thought about it, the more examples that I kept coming back to uh, that I've seen previously for a lot of new shows that be uh, that get uh, released here on the upcoming schedules of sorts, the way that these networks try to market these shows for people to uh, enjoy them, kind of in a way that doesn't really reflect what the show exactly is about, or in some cases just completely ignoring some of the biggest aspects to these shows, specifically the actors that are on the shows or some of the creators behind the shows. Uh, I have a whole series on my channel now, Filmography Filing, which talks about this directly. Uh, the idea of these actors from previous shows that you know and love uh, that are on different projects that you might not be aware of, but they have that name attached to them, right? They have someone like, for example, the cast of How I Met Your Mother, right? A lot of movies, a lot of those other TV shows, very obscure, very, you know, uh, underground, not really something that a mainstream audience would necessarily recognize. But if they have a name like Neil Patrick Harris, if they have a name like Josh Radner, if they have a name like Kobe Smolders, right, attached to it, it definitely brings in a lot more of an audience there. And what I've seen recently, especially, like I said, in the last few weeks or so for the upcoming schedules uh, for the winter or spring schedules when these trailers get released, they just don't really attach those names as prominently as they should. And that's why a lot of these more recent shows are not doing so well as far as their ratings because their marketing is just so disjointed here. Uh, I have a few examples to go over. The one big one that I want to talk about here is this new sitcom, American Auto. We talked about this briefly uh, in some of the previous episodes here. It's a brand new show from NBC here. It debuted back in December there as part of their special preview lineup. And we, we saw, saw this uh, before with some other TV channels as well, such as ABC and their series Abbott Elementary, which premiered after live in front of a studio audience, which was a really good move on their part. Uh, definitely netted them a lot of viewership in that regard. And that was a great way to sort of, uh, you know, let people know that this was on and that this was a brand new series and give them a pilot episode to uh, enjoy and then come back when the winter schedule officially starts, which is this week. And American Auto kind of did the same idea here with two sneak preview episodes that debuted on December 13th. And then the official uh, start to it would be in January here. And this show, I think, is pretty good. But I wouldn't have known that if not for the fact that it also had an encore presentation later after Saturday Night Live that same week. Now, the original marketing behind this show primarily was focused on its creator, Justin Splitzer. Now, you might not recognize that name, but you probably recognize some of the projects that he's done in the past. He's been a writer and a TV producer on several mainstream sitcoms for a very long time now, such as The Office, most prominently, such as Scrubs, such as Grounded for Life, such as Mulaney here. Lots of big name shows that you've probably seen before, but you just might not know all of the producers or the writers attached to it. His big break, though, came in 2015 when he created the show Superstore, which was a huge hit for NBC, ran for six seasons, was very, very highly loved by audiences and critics. And instead of promoting the fact that this gentleman here, Justin Splitzer, was a producer on several other shows that are just as beloved, if not more, than Superstore, they only talked about the fact that Superstore is like his only claim to fame, right? Which as much as it is beloved and, you know, adored by a lot of people, there's a lot of people as well out there that just don't really dig it as much as some of these other shows, like I said, like The Office or Scrubs uh, that he's done in the past. 
And it just seemed like a weird move on NBC's part to kind of alienate again those audiences that might not be as familiar with some of the more recent shows that he's done. The other big name attached to this show was one of its main actresses, Anna Gasteyer, who is an SNL legend, right? Huge, huge back in the 90s there. One of my personal favorites as well. Somehow, NBC completely missed out on putting her name in any of the ads, right? Didn't even bother to sell the fact that she is the lead on this show, despite being such a big name in the world of comedy. For some reason, just completely ignoring the fact that she is a big part of this new series here, and instead focusing on, you know, this guy who, again, they just completely mishandled how they marketed his uh, attachment to this new sitcom here. And I think they realized their mistake because come December 13th, when these two sneak episodes, as they call it, premiered, they completely flopped in the ratings here, uh, completely was overtaken by, you know, newer episodes of more established shows there. Uh, like I said, the marketing just did not do anything for them and completely fizzled out here so much so that they're already within two episodes in. Uh, considering canceling this series because it was such a disaster when they started it. Uh, so they took an initiative to, you know, kind of fix the way that they marketed the show and try to help it out a little bit, give it a little bit of a boost so that the fans of the show would obviously not see that cancellation so quickly. And they did that by premiering an encore after the episode of SNL that was going to be premiering that same week there, which was their Christmas special hosted by Paul Rudd, which was a really fun episode, despite a lot of the uh, sort of setbacks they had that same week. That's kind of, if you know, you know, sort of a situation there. But uh, they premiered the pilot after that episode of SNL, and it actually was pretty damn good. I stuck around for it, really enjoyed this show, thought Anna Gasteyer did a really good job, as well as all the other mainstay actors on American Auto here. And it turns out that a lot of people also really enjoyed this series after seeing it post-SNL. And it kind of revived it a little bit. And now it gives it a little bit of a better uh, ch you know, chance when it comes to the main schedule that it's supposed to be slated on, which is uh, going to premiere this week here. I think it's supposed to premiere on Tuesday, actually, which is today as I record this. So that'll be really interesting to see how it ends up working out uh, future, you know, going forward within the next couple of weeks here. So that is one of the main kind of arguments that I would have is why it's so important to kind of slate these shows in a way that gets people talking, right? Uh, they really had a good opportunity to put this with uh, big names that were attached to the show, and they didn't do that. They had a good opportunity to give uh, sort of a sneak preview and a pilot episode. They really fumbled the ball there, and really their only saving grace was the fact that SNL still, after all this time, is as popular as it is, which was kind of their, you know, kind of silver lining here in this whole story. Uh, but some shows, unfortunately, are not as lucky here. Another example of a show that recently had a premiere in the same way here was Grand Crew, another NBC sitcom that had that sneak preview ahead of time that is going to be slated for the schedule here in winter. This one premiered on December 14th, uh, so the day after, again, with the first two episodes here. And again, there were some really big names attached to the show, specifically Garrett Morris here as the show's narrator, uh, kind of the over overarching, you know, kind of voice of the series or similar to like a Bob Saget on How I Met Your Mother or, or say in the New Wonder Years, someone like Don Cheadle as well as kind of the narrator. And Garrett Morris, of course, is another one that's been a part of the sitcom landscape and kind of been a big part of the um, comedy, you know, world for a very, very long time now, again, on SNL, but also was on shows like Two Broke Girls and The Jamie Foxx Show. And again, not attaching his name to this show was a huge misfire for NBC again, because that is just such a big way to get a mainstream audience excited for this new series here. Uh, they also had one of the leads as well were on some uh, notable sitcoms uh, from back in the 2010s as well, Echo Kellum here. 
uh, who was on the Fox show Ben and Kate, as well as Sean Saves the World on NBC. So had some comedy experience in that as well here. Uh, so just a couple, you know, examples where they really kind of, again, mishandled and kind of misfired their marketing strategy here. It just kind of relied that the show itself was funny enough and they had, you know, enough good promotional material for it to sustain itself when in actuality it just did not do that and actually had worse premiere numbers numbers than American Auto did and again is facing cancellation already only two episodes in. So that's another instance where again NBC just really had uh, sort of this kind of you know boneheaded move on their part of how to market these shows and how to promote these shows properly that just really failed on their part there. Um, there are some examples where even if a show doesn't necessarily have the best marketing, it is able to uh, kind of, you know, sustain itself if the show is good enough on behalf that, you know, critics like it and, and audiences enjoy the quality of it, of course. And we've seen that with shows like Keenan or Mr. Mayor in the past, a couple other NBC sitcoms that premiered last year in 2020 that didn't have the best marketing behind them, despite having, you know, huge names attached like Ted Danson or Keenan Thompson. Uh, but the quality of those shows was definitely enough to sustain them throughout, and they're both getting a second season here in 2021. There's, There's also, also been a couple of big drama shows in the last couple of years as well that have had the same issue, and one that I want to talk about is Big Sky. Big Sky was a really, really great uh, drama, almost had like a thriller sort of mystery aspect to it, and this one premiered back in November of 2020, uh, one of my favorite shows from the year, despite it being kind of a crappy year for TV, of course, due to COVID and whatnot. But uh, this show definitely kind of brought new life into ABC's drama lineup. I thought they had a really good uh, sort of, you know, baseline foundation for it. Uh, it was based off a book series called The Highway by C.J. Box, who is a really kind of notable, you know, mystery uh author and has done a lot of big uh, sort of novels in that genre for a very long time now. And it was created by David E. Kelly, who is a television legend at this point, huge producer. He's done shows like Doogie Howser, MD, Picket Fences, Chicago Hope, The Practice, Ally McBeal, Boston Legal, Big Little Lies. I mean, the, the names just go on and on and on. So this was definitely a good you know foundation they had for this show now it comes down to how they're going to market this what names are they going to put in the promos for people to come back and check out this show and despite having an all-star cast here of tons of great actors who have been on shows like chicago pd the goldbergs the pitch uh just tons and tons of big name dramas and sitcoms here all over time despite having all these big name actors attached to the project here and having just you know so much success on other shows previously that they again could have implemented onto the marketing here they chose to heavily promote the fact that the actor ryan Philippi was going to be part of this series now this is at the point where unfortunately i have to get into spoilers just to kind of uh, you know, defend my argument here. So if you haven't seen Big Sky at this point, skip to this part in the video. I'm going to leave a timestamp here because if you don't want spoilers, you know, you just pass over this part. But if you're still with me here, Ryan Phillippe's character, despite how, have, uh, how heavy the marketing was for his presence here, literally dies in the very first episode <laughs> of the series and is not seen except for flashbacks and you know uh, past moments within the series going forward there and really only appears in i think the first like four or five episodes to the show so all of that marketing completely down the drain after the first episode premiered definitely not a good move on abc's part despite the fact that the show was really good uh, and somehow was able to sustain itself through that again another example where marketing here just plays such a big 
part of the TV sort of, you know, competitiveness of sorts. Definitely something that ABC has learned their lesson from going forward here as they applied this to another show that premiered earlier in 2021 here, live in front of a studio audience. Now this, like I said earlier, uh, was kind of the forefront for the sitcom uh, Abbott Elementary, which premiered right afterwards. But this is something that ABC has done for a couple of times now. They started this back in 2019, and this was a really interesting idea for a show. This is now the third time they've done it here. And the whole gimmick of this is essentially that they have a studio audience and actors reenacting old episodes of classic sitcoms here. So the first one that they did was All in the Family and The Jeffersons, two really iconic shows from the 70s, of course, considered some of the best of all time by many individuals here. And that was a really interesting sort of aspect to take where they have these classic old school episodes that everyone knows and loves and kind of revamp them and give them a bit of a facelift with these uh, you know, more modern day actors kind of implementing themselves as these older characters and reenacting it for a new generation of individuals here and I thought that was a really interesting idea uh, the second one they did was based on good times again another very iconic classic uh, old-school sitcom here definitely one that I think a lot of people back in the day were um, you know very influenced by because it always had that sort of more adult theme to it. It kind of had a more mature aspect, uh, mature angle to it of sorts that you wouldn't normally find uh, in classic sitcoms at the time. So definitely has you know stood the test of time, been very sustainable all these years later. And then the more recent one that we are going to talk about today, it, it was based on the facts of life and different strokes. So again, more old school sitcoms there. Again, uh, just you know very iconic in that sense. And what's really cool about this whole, uh, you know, event uh, as a whole as well is none of these sitcoms were solely based on, you know, one channel's pre-existing library. Uh, they pulled them from NBC, they pulled them from ABC, they pulled them from CBS, and it was just this, you know, celebration of sorts of all these classic shows uh, coming together and, you know, kind of sustaining themselves all these years later and saying, you know, these are still really, really uh, special episodes that we want to share with younger generations and we want to continue the legacy of these shows. And, you know, any of that sort of trivial uh, aspects to it, like, you know, who owned the rights to these shows, they didn't let that get in the way. And it was just a fun, you know, celebration of sorts that people could just relax to. And they did that really well with the facts of life and different strokes, like I said, the most recent airing of it. Uh, but the whole sort of gimmick that I want to talk about is how, again, they marketed these shows. Because when you have this idea of we're going to take these old school classic sitcoms here, who are we going to get to play those very iconic characters? Because, again, we can't get the older actors, right? We can't get people uh, from the original because at this point they're too old to replay some of their uh, iconic characters in that sense and have it be believable. So we're going to take as many big name actors as we can get who are still you know, very relevant and very popular nowadays and implement them into a way that is very just very much just a special celebration of sorts. And the way that they got that was to bring in people like Jennifer Aniston, like Will Arnett, like Jason Bateman, like Jon Stewart, like Katherine Hahn, like Kevin Hart, like Damon Wayans, like John Lithgow. I mean, they had an all-star cast here for the most recent airing of it. And even before, they had huge names for some of the previous episodes as well, like Jamie Foxx, Viola Davis, Tiffany Haddish, Anthony Anderson, Kevin Bates. Bacon, Jesse Eisenberg, Jennifer Hudson. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And this is one of the rare areas where I think ABC really shines as far as how they promote their shows is just to get all of these big name actors and just throw everything at the wall and hope it sticks. And they absolutely did just that. The most recent episode with the facts of life and different strokes brought in about 5 million live viewers. They're a huge number, bigger than any other comedy episode 
that ABC has aired during this TV season now, which really isn't that notable considering how low the bar is, but still very, very, very cool for them uh, to see you know, how big this event was for them. And then in the 18 to 49 demo as well, a 1.2 rating, which again is just massive here. Uh, a lot of older folks, of course, watching this as well here uh, as kind of being nostalgic for some of these older shows, again, being reenacted by newer actors there. So I thought that was a really, really interesting uh, sort of concept for them. But that, again, is how you do it there uh, as kind of an example of what to do when it comes to the marketing of these shows. The last example that I want to go over here real quick is the series FBI. Now, FBI, of course, needs no introduction. One of the biggest franchises right now on TV, of course, created by Dick Wolf here of Law & Order fame. And this was another big police procedural uh, sort of crime drama series that premiered back in 2018 for him and now has two spinoff episodes uh, or excuse me, spinoff series rather, uh, in the form of International and Most Wanted here. And FBI as a whole is a show that I definitely recommend if you like that classic formula, that classic police procedural type format. Very, very reminiscent of older, sort of more 80s and 90s shows, but with a very fresh take on the genre as well here. And again, the marketing behind these shows was absolutely fantastic. Most notably, though, I want to talk about one episode in particular that I thought was really interesting that they were able to market really well. And is one of my favorites of the series here. And that is the uh, season two finale here called Emotional Rescue. Now, what makes this episode so interesting is the fact that they had a guest star from a different Dick Wolf show in the form of Tracy Spiridonkos from Chicago PD, who plays Haley on the show. And in this episode, she's playing her in-universe character of Haley Upton. And this was a really cool thing to see because not only did uh, Dick Wolf uh, do these crossovers, of course, from before with other Chicago shows and the Law and Orders as well, and now bringing FBI into it is just expanding on that universe. But also because, again, they didn't let the fact that the networks get in the way of this, right? The Chicago shows and, and most uh, Dick Wolf shows in general are broadcast on NBC. FBI is one of the first to be premiered on a different network, uh, in this case CBS. And even despite that, they still manage to let people know that this person, Tracy Spiridonkos, is from a different network show in the form of Chicago PD. They didn't let politics get in the way. They didn't let their egos get in the way. Chicago PD and, you know, the Chicago's as a whole are famously more popular than FBI. So it was a great move on their behalf to bring in, you know, someone from a more established show, even if that did mean, you know, kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, in some way, uh, putting themselves down a little bit, you know, admitting that maybe they're not as popular, but maybe could get that uh, get that way if they bring in some of these crossovers and make it more known and kind of try to establish a more mainstream audience with it. And like I said, this was a really good episode, definitely one of my favorites as well. And for many people, the first introduction they might have had to the Chicago series here, as it was the highest rated episode of season two with nearly 11 million viewers there, one of the highest of the entire series in that matter. So that is just another example of why uh, advertising and why marketing is so, so important and definitely something that I think needs to be uh, you know, expanded upon in 2022. We saw some good examples. We saw some bad examples here, but hopefully these networks can learn from their mistakes and start doing it in a more established way going forward for the next year here. All right, let's move on to another topic here. I know that one we kind of rambled on a little bit, so we'll go through these next couple a little bit quicker. Uh, but another example of something that I want to see improve going forward here uh, for 2022, and this one is not on the network specifically, but more so on the fans of TV, the TV community as a whole here, and some of the discourse surrounding how we discuss TV nowadays online or in person whatever it might be, uh, and the fact that a lot of the time, network TV, broadcast network TV, CBS, NBC, Fox, ABC, whatever it might be, generally gets ignored nowadays by TV audiences and the TV community as a whole here. You can see this pretty much in any sort of discourse or forums 
online where people are talking about what their favorite shows are on certain networks or excuse me certain platforms like netflix hulu stuff like that and the amount of times that you'll see answers to those questions be shows such as the office so shows such as Grey's Anatomy, Criminal Minds, How I Met Your Mother, Parks and Recreation, Family Guy, The Simpsons, stuff like that, that are now on those platforms, whether it be Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu or something like that, but also originated from network TV and found their audience on network TV. And a lot of the time when I see these sorts of things, it usually comes in the form of individuals who are not so much, you know, established in the TV community, right? Are not like me where they're doing shows like this or they're really analyzing all the different aspects of TV. They're more so they're more so on a casual sort of watcher type of attitude when it comes to this medium here. They're only going to watch it if it's something that everybody else is checking out, right? If it's only something that people are really, really excited for, right? If it's a big event show, they'll watch it. But otherwise, they probably are going to ignore a lot of the smaller shows. And a lot of that comes in the form that Netflix and Hulu offer these individuals a very easy, accessible way to check out these shows that they know are legendary, that they know are, you know, considered some of the best of all time, but they just don't have access to any other spot where these shows are being broadcasted, of course, because they're not on network TV anymore. And that is kind of the kind of disconnect where they want to celebrate these shows and they want to understand the legacy of these shows but they're not doing it in a way that sort of uh, complements or, you know, sort of genuinely emphasizes where these shows came from. And it's one of the things that I try to strive for on my channel is always promoting network TV because I feel like that's definitely some, uh, you know, place where a lot of legacy shows come from. And all these newer shows that have debuted in the last few years or even this year that we go over pretty routinely when we talk about the different schedules and stuff uh, are kind of laying the groundwork for the next batch of those shows to come forward, right? We've seen shows like The Good Place, for example, uh, in 2016. That's one of the you know best shows of all time, and that's only been around for five years or so. And that was on NBC. You know, that wasn't from Netflix. That wasn't from a streaming service. Um, and it's not just network TV as well, but also cable TV in kind of the same light with shows like Breaking Bad, with shows like Mad Men, with shows like The Walking Dead all shows that are on just basic cable, right, AMC, that have only been around for maybe 10 or 15 years that, again, are some of the greatest of all time there. And most people recognize them now because they're on Netflix and they're very accessible there. And in their minds, they consider that a Netflix show. They consider Netflix to be the, propi the proprietor or the originator of it, which is just not true, you know? And so the kind of, kind of conversation that I want this to kind of spark or, or maybe some of the discussions surrounding this topic uh, pretty much just goes through the narrative of just being more informed, right? That's all I ask. If you're watching a show on Netflix, you know, maybe try to think about where it came from, where it originated from, and uh, kind of give credit where credit is due and not so much say that, oh, it's on Netflix, so, you know, must have come from Netflix because sometimes that just isn't the case. And none of this is meant to put streaming services down. They obviously are very, very popular. I use them all the time myself, so it's not trying to bash what Netflix is doing right now. They, too, have some of the best shows of all time on their platform that they were the ones behind. But at the same time, they also offer a lot of bad stuff, and so does network TV. It's not so much that one is inherently better than the other, right? They both have their pros and cons. And I think in general, just, you know, these big broadcasters like CBS or NBC just get looked at as, you know, inferior for not always the most justified of reasons, right? Because they had one bad show over the course of a few years because they had a couple bad shows together on a schedule does not, uh, you know, discredit or undermine all the good that they've done in the last 50, 70 years of TV, right? 
So that's just kind of one of my uh, bigger pet peeves when it comes to sort of the discourse surrounding TV nowadays. But again, you know, you might think differently, of course. So if you have anything to say on that, definitely let me know in the comments because that's one in particular that I'm always looking out for, seeing how people feel about that particular subject. So now that we've gone over a few of the more negative aspects or things that I hope to see change in the future, let's talk about some stuff that network TV and you know TV as a whole have been doing in the last few years that I think is fantastic that I wanna see continue going forward here because I think it is great for the culture surrounding this medium here. And the first one I wanna talk about here is the advent of mini series and anthology types of series here. These have popped up a lot recently in the last year or so with big, big shows across all major platforms kind of adapting this mini series title here as sort of a way to get people interested in a show that they're not gonna have to slog through six, seven, eight seasons worth of content to wrap up this storyline. They can watch it in the course of six to eight or 10 episodes instead. And it's a really easy way for people to just digest very subtly uh, these, these you know, programs and these series that aren't so much about huge character arcs, that aren't so much about massive stories that span the course of years and years. They're just simple, very down-to-earth stories with relatable characters that are just a lot of fun to see. A lot of the time they're based on true stories, which is a great way for that sort of crowd to get in on it as well here. Sometimes they're superhero type stories like we've seen with WandaVision, for example, one of my favorite miniseries of the last year. Uh, but just some of the you know better ways that TV uh, networks now and these production companies are kind of implementing a way for people to digest these more subtly uh, available stories in a very convenient way. Uh, with anthology shows as well, uh, those are a great genre because it's only one episode at a time that you have to watch as well. So, for example, a show like Black Mirror, for instance, one of my all-time favorites here I talked about previously on the channel as well here. Uh, one of my favorites because of the fact that it's so quick, right? Bite-sized episodes that you can watch for 45 minutes to an hour at a time and get a complete story with its completed characters in that time frame. Again, you don't have to slog through multiple seasons at a time here. And it also, I think, is beneficial for the networks in question to promote shows like this because they only have to produce X amount of episodes as opposed to doing like a 22 order season or something like that. They only have to do, like I said, like six to eight episodes for an entire season, which is gonna be way more cost effective and way cheaper to do than you know traditional TV where you might have upwards of say 24 to 25 episodes per season which is just going to be way too much to handle all at once um, it's interesting to see the evolution of this as well because if you go back to the 60s or the 70s or so uh, and you look at those old sitcoms or old cartoons from back in the day sometimes they would have upwards of 50 to 60 episodes per season right so if you have a show that lasted five seasons for example and they all had 50 episodes that's 250 episodes for one show which is just kind of ludicrous at that point right i like a long show every now and again uh you're talking to a guy who loves shows like law and order svu right that has 500 episodes under its belt but that seems to be uh, a little overkill you know depending on the series of course uh, as we transition to more of, you know, the modern day or kind of previously, like, say, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, that was where you got your traditional 20 to 25 episode, you know, season limit for a lot of those big network shows. And then for newer ones, maybe it would be half of that, maybe at like 12 or 13, right, if it's uh, something that's going to come into the spring and it's only going to last half a season, maybe something like 13, you know, was the average but in the world of streaming nowadays, it's definitely more common to see, again, those shorter series, those mini series of sorts that are also only going to be slated for a single season. That's the other thing. Um, a lot of days now, TV shows will go in knowing how many seasons long it's going to be. 
uh, so that way they don't have to stress themselves out of producing X amount of episodes to just fill up the time. They have a predetermined schedule of how long it's going to last, which, again, is very beneficial, I think, for everybody. But um, in the world of streaming, like I said, you know, now it's common to see 8 to 10 episode series. So it keeps shrinking as we go forward. So maybe in 20 years from now, um, we won't even have, you know, season-long um, you know, arcs anymore. We'll only see like two or something per season. Um, and it'll be like, you know, big expanded movies essentially, um, within this time frame. So kind of interesting to see, like I said, the evolution there, but I think it's all for the better. I love a short digestible, you know, bite-sized series like that. I can knock out in a weekend if I wanted to, and hope to see more of that going forward here in the next year. Another thing that I think is really good on behalf of the industry and, and you know some of the networks that they are doing recently are the way that they stack their shows on the schedule, right? Uh, again, we've talked about this previously on the channel here when we go over the winter schedules or the fall schedules, and we've seen networks like CBS, for example, really take their time to figure out what shows are going to work well next to each other if they have all the FBI's at once, right? 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, perfect layout for a complete day of you know TV there. If you have on NBC, for example, the Chicago shows or the Law & Order shows as well, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, again, a perfect run of shows that'll keep people occupied and interested the entire time, right? In now, all platforms now, it's not so much how many individual things you're watching, uh, like how many you know different shows you could watch or, you know, Take example from a different platform like YouTube, for example, how many individual videos can you watch, but more so how long you're watching those videos for. If you're only sticking around for the first five minutes, obviously not really beneficial for everybody. If you're watching it for the entire time, that's obviously what they want you to do. So having that sort of incentive to stick around for the entire night and watch through all the shows, definitely something that I think these networks are improving upon now. On occasion, you'll see some, such as ABC, for instance, try to throw their hand out there, but it just doesn't really mesh well with what audiences want. Um, I've always been kind of cynical of the classic sort of format where you have uh, four sitcoms, right? Eight, eight thirty, nine, nine thirty, and then a ten o'clock drama. Because I feel like a lot of the time, people like me who are definitely more into comedy and you know, sort of a lighter sort of uh, style of TV will, you know, kind of be alienated by that drama, usually don't stick around for that. I never understood why they just don't do two more at the end, right, 10 and 10.30. That's always kind of, you know, been something that I've, you know, taken notice of. But for the most part, um, I think these networks now are kind of getting better at, you know, understanding audiences and kind of seeing what they want in return and, um, you know, it all kind of being beneficial for everyone, like I said. So uh, a few examples that I can throw out there that I want to see more of going forward again in 2022. And the last one that I have to talk to you about for stuff that I think is positive and really, really good for the community as a whole here uh, actually comes more so from online and, again, in, in forums and different discourse that you can see, not so much from the networks themselves, but more so the conversations that you have with other TV fans out there. The ability to find information regarding any show, opinions about any show, that are both positive and negative equally. This is something that I think is really important for discourse and just conversation in general for pretty much any topic, but especially things regarding art. Because art, you know, at its core is very subjective and you could have a completely different opinion than someone else. And being able to access that information and find people readily that will be willing to give an unpopular opinion, be willing to give an opinion that is, um, you know, different than what the norm uh, has kind of set for itself. And having access to that information so easily, I think is really beneficial for pretty much everyone to have these more mature, more serious conversations about what perfection is or what something labeled great or something labeled bad uh, kind of represents, right? What does that actually mean? 
And especially people like me who, you know, do this for fun here on YouTube, or if you go on Reddit, you see this a lot as well, different forums, you can have these really insightful, really intelligent conversations about some of the dumbest TV shows out there, um, but in a way that's elevated because art is so expansive and, you know, everyone has a different concept of what that actually means. So again, having that information so readily available and so accessible, uh, always love to get people in on it too. You know, whenever I'm introduced to someone, you know, talking about what their favorite art is, you know, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite music and stuff? Very easy to connect with someone over that, right? And they also say that it's easier to connect over things that you dislike than things that you actually like. So that's pretty interesting as well. If there's a lot of things out there that people just hate, you know, that are just awful, terrible TV shows or terrible music or something, that'll actually bring people together more so than some of the best out there, which I think is pretty fascinating for, you know, again, conversation there. And um, some other uh, great resources to find this information as well out there would be places like IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes, right? That kind of aggregate all of these scores together, all of these different points together uh, and give you an average and then break it all down for you in a very digestible way. If you go to IMDb, you can see, of course, how many stars out of 10 the show as a whole has, but then they have the individual episodes as well. They have user reviews on there. You can see the percentage of how many people voted for it to be a 10 out of 10, how many people voted for it to be a 9 out of 10, et cetera, et cetera. And kind of seeing the uh, sort of breakdown of it all is really fascinating if you want a more statistical kind of side of things as well. With Rotten Tomatoes, what's interesting is they give you the percentage, of course, for a TV show or a TV season, but then they also give a score of it out of 10 as well. And you can see sometimes those aren't always the same because Rotten Tomatoes formula uh, is a little bit different depending on the medium that they're using. So for TV, they'll have it where if it's at least a six out of 10, it's considered a positive review. So sometimes when you go to Rotten Tomatoes and you see it has a 100% rating, that might only average out to like a six or a 6.5. But a, a show that has a 100% rating could also average out to a 10 out of 10 because that's the way that they calculate that formula between a 6 and a 10. It's all net positive. And so if the percentage, it's displaying that as such, which is really interesting when you see a, when you see 100% ratings on there because they're so common nowadays, they don't always mean the same thing. So again, having that information very accessible to you know your basic mainstream audience is really beneficial in seeing the breakdown of how this show compares to this and why on the surface they might seem like they're equal but when you dig a little deeper they might not be that way uh, under the surface which I think is really really good as well uh, just for the culture as a whole so there you have it there are a few different topics that I consider negative overall that I want to see improve going forward and some good stuff that I want to see continue or even get more expansive going forward as well. Again, let me know in the comments anything you have to say on these topics here. If you agree or disagree with me, that is totally cool. As long as you keep it civil, we can have a great discussion there in the comments as always. Uh, to wrap up this episode real quick here, maybe give this or so 10 minutes or so. I know we're running long, so try to keep this under an hour here. Uh, I'm going to go over a few of my most anticipated TV shows for 2022. I know a lot of people, some of the big uh, platforms and news outlets have already covered this, so I kind of want to give you my take on it. Uh, most of these shows admittedly are shows that are based on existing properties or existing shows as well. Uh, probably my number one here and the one that we're going to start off with, How I Met Your Father. Of course, many of you know, pretty much anyone that's seen this show at this point or, or my channel uh, know that How I Met Your Mother is my favorite TV show of all time. So when it was announced that they were doing a spinoff, a reboot sort of thing uh, in the form of How I Met Your Father, you know I had to be on board with it. Uh, Hilary Duff as the lead I think is going to be a really fun uh, kind of role for her. She hasn't really done much in the public eye, at least uh, you know something as big as this since probably Lizzie McGuire since her uh, Disney Channel days, but uh, definitely very exciting to see her back in you know the spotlight there. I think she's a really good actress. 
Uh, there's a couple other names attached to the project that might have some smaller roles as well, like Josh Peck, I've, hear, I've heard uh, get thrown around, which of course, if you know Drake and Josh, you know that he is fantastic as well. And then all of the original creators, Craig Thomas and Carter Bays are coming back as producers on the show. And Pamela Fryman, I know, is set to direct some of the episodes and be a producer as well. And she was the lead director for the original How I Met Your Mother. So that'll be really cool to see as well. Um, but yeah, overall looks like a really, really solid return to form. Not so sure how it's going to connect, if it is at all going to connect to the original. Um, I've heard some people say that they might have just sort of references or different cameos within the show connecting the two, or it might just be formatted similar to the original with the voiceover and the flashbacks and the fast forwards, all that good stuff that you know and love from the original How I Met Your Mother that will just be implemented into the same sort of presentation of sorts on this show as well. Uh, that one's set to premiere in January here, January 18th on Hulu, so that is definitely one that I'll be checking out. Another one that is based on a pre-existing show that I'm a big fan of, uh, Tales from the Walking Dead here. Uh, this is set to be slated sometime this year. Not really sure exactly when. Uh, they haven't given an official release date yet, but of course The Walking Dead is fantastic. It's going to come to a close this year, and they have already two existing spinoff shows one of them i know already got um already ended rather uh wasn't canceled it you know voluntarily ended its run uh last year in 2020 and then the fear of the walking dead is the one that is continuing here and i think it's in its sixth or seventh season now so that will continue and that's already being um broadcasted along this final season of the original Walking Dead as well here, uh, which is going to run through the rest of 2020 as well up until the summer. And then in the fall, maybe, or maybe the late winter, we'll get um, Tales of the Walking Dead, which is the next planned spinoff as well. Really, the one that I'm really excited to see is uh, the Carol and Daryl spinoff, because they're two of my favorite characters, but that's not slated till 2023, so it'll be a little while till we get that one at least. But uh, Tales from the Walking Dead, anything regarding, uh, of course, the Walking Dead and that franchise, you know, I'm on board with, so definitely will be exciting to check that out very soon. Uh, another one that I think is going to be really fun to see, which is slated sometime again this year, not exactly sure when, but hopefully sometime uh, in the summer or maybe the fall, kind of mid-year um, would be a good reason why, and I'll explain in just a minute here, is Law & Order Hate Crimes. This is set to premiere hopefully on Peacock, which will be pretty interesting because they don't have, at least to my knowledge, a pre-existing show that is, you know, part of a huge franchise that isn't already on TV, right? They have some originals on there, but they're not anything connected to a pre-existing series or pre-existing franchise that's, you know, broadcasting on NBC right now. So this would be a great way for people to get invested into Peacock and kind of, you know, rise up its popularity a little bit if they have a exclusive show on there that is part of a larger franchise or larger, you know, series like that. And Law and & Order would be a great pick for them because, of course, in 2021 as well, we're getting the new Law & Order series, um, which is just more of a, a continuation of the original, more or less, season 21 technically, but uh, sort of a revival as well, which is set to premiere in the winter and then run through the rest of the winter and spring along with the remainder of this season for Organized Crime and SVU. So you run all those, and then in the summer, that would be really, uh, I think, appropriate to drop hate crimes on Peacock and then kind of set that out for the few months in between the schedules there, run through like June to August, and then come back uh, in the fall of 2022 with more episodes of SVU, Organized Crime, and the original on, on a fall schedule. So that would kind of be my uh, play for it if I was in charge. Um, but again, hate crimes, we're not exactly sure when it was supposed to come out. It was originally slated for 2021, um, but due to, you know, delays and stuff and the fact that Dick Wolf uh, excuse me Dick Wolf was working on so many other projects um the revival and then organized crime as well which premiered in 2021 as well back in March so it's been a really like hectic you know sort of um year and and really tough to keep up with it all but um definitely hate crimes looks like it would be a more mature take on it it would have some more you know adult themes to it um they said 
I was reading that they couldn't put it on NBC because of language. So whatever that means, exactly, I guess it would, you know, have a little bit more mature dialogue to it and such. It would almost play out like a more premium uh, crime drama, something like The Sopranos would on, you know, a, on a channel like HBO where they could get away with that kind of stuff. And I think Peacock would be a really, you know, appropriate platform for that and kind of tie into, again, the pre-existing franchise, which Law & Order is. So that'll be really interesting to see. But again, a lot of um, sort of reservations on that one as far as like when it'll debut and, and how it'll debut and kind of uh, fit into the rest of the Law & Order universe of sorts there. Um, another one that is not necessarily new, but more of a continuation from a show that premiered last year is the next season of iCarly here. This is the only show that I've included on this list that is, you know, a, another season of it because it was my favorite show from 2021. Season two is set to premiere sometime again in 2022. Not exactly sure when. I would assume probably sometime in the summer because that's when the original came out. Um, or the, the first season, rather, I should say, um, premiered in the summer. So it makes sense to do that. Um, if you saw season one, then you know season one's finale definitely set up a lot of big things with its characters and kind of ended a little bit on a cliffhanger. So it'll definitely be really cool to see um, how they continue on with that going into season two. Definitely a big fan of the more mature you know style that they've taken on. Again, one of my favorite things about iCarly 2021 one in general is that it's more fitting for an older audience that grew up with the original and are, are now in their you know late or uh, excuse me early 20s like I am and kind of promoting that sort of format and, and presentation for a more older audience that are now uh, able to relate to those more adult situations that they're having on the show so that's you know part of the reason why I love it so much so definitely looking forward to that season two of iCarly there so I think that's all these shows that I had here um, that were based on a series going forward. So let's talk about uh, shows that are brand new, that are, you know, a, an original IP, an original idea that are also going to come out in 2022 here, starting with probably the most recent show that is set to debut tomorrow as I record this on the 5th, which is Good Sam here. Um, I mentioned this before when we were talking about the winter schedules. Good Sam is a new medical drama from CBS here starring Jason Isaacs and Sophia Bush, which I'm very excited for. Um, definitely one of my favorite actresses, of course, from Chicago PD and One Tree Hill. Even though I've never some, seen One Tree Hill, I know that it's very popular as well there for her. And uh, this looks really good. I've seen some trailers for it. I'm definitely not a medical show kind of guy. I think many people know that. Not really a genre that I click with all that much, even though I am starting to kind of expand my uh, appreciation for them a little bit. Um, but this one looks really interesting. It's about the uh, daughter of this, you know, huge kind of investor, um, you know, businessman kind of guy who runs this hospital, and that's Jason Isaac's character. And his daughter, played by Sophia Bush, um, ends up taking over for his position as kind of this director of this huge hospital when he slips into a coma. When he gets out of it, he's kind of confused as to why this happened, and there's kind of this competition between them to see who can outdo each other um, to prove themselves more as a more appropriate lead for this position here. And, and it'll have some comedic moments to it, it looks like. I think it's going to be more based on like the drama of that sort of competition and kind of the... and. Um, not really the chaos, uh, I was going to say, but more of the um, kind of chemistry between all the characters and kind of the banter that they have back and forth. It seems like it's going to be more or less, um, you know, dialogue heavy than more of a traditional medical show, which is more about like the patients and stuff. It doesn't really seem like it's going to focus on that aspect to it, which I think is good because that's one of the main sort of areas of that particular format that I just don't really vibe with um, seeing like the surgeries and stuff that's just not really my cup of tea so if it'll have less of that and more of like the centralized characters and the dialogue and stuff that is what I'm all for and Sophia Bush does that really well so definitely seeing like uh, that's going to turn out to be a massive hit for CBS there um, it's going to be interesting to see again it competing with Chicago PD 
because that was the show that she was on formerly, and they're premiering the same day, so that'll be kind of interesting to see how the ratings turn out for it, but quality-wise, I think that's going to be one of my favorites going forward. Um, another one that I actually just found out about the other day here, which I didn't even know that they were making a show based on this, but I am psyched for this, is called The Dropout here. This one is set to premiere on Hulu once again on March 3rd of this year, and this one is based on Elizabeth Holmes here, who was the CEO and kind of the uh, creator of Theranos, this company that she founded back in 2016, maybe 2017, somewhere around there. And um, it was going to be this, um, it was supposed to be, uh, excuse me, supposed to be part of the healthcare system, and it was going to be based on blood testing. So she was going to make all these machines that were um, more streamlined uh, way to test your blood and, and check for all these diseases that you could have. And it'd be like a really simple, quick process. And, you know, she had all this advanced technology of sorts that were going to be implemented into these uh, like kiosks that you could just go to your normal, you know, pharmacy, like a CVS or something or a Walgreens, and you could use these and it would only take like half an hour, which is a fraction of the time that it would normally take and stuff. All these, you know, great advancements that she was supposed to, um, you know, revolutionize the healthcare system with essentially. And a couple um, years into it, you know, all these investors, they weren't really seeing a profit on it. They weren't really seeing uh, any sort of changes to anything that she promised. And it was all kind of looking a little suspicious. And eventually um, someone kind of tipped off the authorities that it was all kind of a scam and, and she was a big fraud and everything. And now there's a whole investigation going on it. Um, actually, as recently as this week, she's on trial right now for all this. So we'll have to see how that comes out as well. But uh, when I found out they were making a show about this, I was instantly hooked because the Elizabeth Holmes story, I think, is really fascinating. I've seen a few documentaries here and there about it. Just a really interesting um you know, kind of project to base a mini series on, which is what this is going to be. And it's going to be um, Amanda Seyfried is going to play Elizabeth Holmes, who I think is a really talented actress as well. Originally, it was going to be Kate McKinnon from SNL, but she had to exit it and she had some other um, you know, projects in the works that she was doing instead. So uh, kind of just time constraints is why she had to leave. But Amanda Seyfried is great as well. But she's not the only big name attached to this. In reoccurring roles and kind of uh, guest starring roles, we're going to see people like Kurtwood Smith from That 70s Show. We're going to see Kevin Sussman from The Big Bang Theory, Dylan Minnette from 13 Reasons Why, uh, Stephen Fry as well, huge name as well, Lori Metcalf. There are so many people attached to this project, and it is going to be so fun to see. Um, Sam Watterson as well from Law & Order. I just saw him looking at the cast list right now. It is a stacked cast. It's probably going to be one of the most anticipated just for the fact that all of these people's fan base are going to be, uh, you know, interested in checking this out. So if any of those names, you know, you're a fan of any of those shows, definitely put this one on your schedule because I will definitely be seeing this as well. Like I said, March 3rd is when this is going to debut here on Hulu, which will be very exciting. Another mini series that is set to debut on Hulu as well going forward here is one called Pam and Tommy. This is a, um, it's going to be based on the life of Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee here, a uh, former drummer, of course, from Motley Crue, and then Pamela Anderson, big actress and model from the 90s there. And they were married for a little while, and their relationship was very, very public for a very long time. Uh, one of the tabloid's favorite, you know, kind of celebrity couples at the time to always kind of get the insight as to what they were doing. Um, individually, they were very famous, of course, in their own lanes, but together they became, you know, kind of this tabloid, um, you know, couple and and you know all the things that they had done while they were married and stuff were big news all the time um they made a sex tape together and that was very public as well that's one of the selling points of the show and it has a really good set list of uh, actors as well that are going to be part of it um not so much in the main roles but sort of the reoccurring roles as well i think seth rogan is one of them who i think is really cool but i'm just a big fan of um you know biography type stories and kind of more serialized stories and again this is going to be a mini series so it's going to be a really quick watch um only going to be like 10 episodes or something like that 
and a really fascinating sort of um, thing to draw from. Again, these uh, sort of tabloid couples, they're always getting into massive hijinks and, and all sorts of stuff like that. So it'll probably have some comedic elements as well. But yeah, if you like uh, the story of Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee, I think that's going to be a fun one to check out. Uh, and then two more before we wrap up here. We have uh, Abbott Elementary is one that I had on this list. It's technically you know already aired its pilot back in December, but it will actually continue to air uh, going forward here. Actually tonight as I record this on Tuesday, it's supposed to uh, debut its second episode. So definitely we'll be checking that out. I think Abbott Elementary is one of the best sitcoms that ABC has put out in a very long time. Arguably the best that they've had all year as far as 2021 goes or you know this upcoming schedule considering the fact that a lot of the shows that they have on right now are just not doing it at all a lot of their newer stuff hasn't really been you know that popular with critics or, or audiences but hopefully Abbott Elementary will turn that around for them uh, Tyler James Williams on that show right now definitely looking like a standout character from the series um, one of my favorites and then the last show that I had to talk about here on my list was a brand new cooking show that just premiered uh, the other day here, I think on the 2nd of January. So it like literally just came out here and it's called Next Level Chef. This was actually on the winter schedule when we went over it, but we didn't really know anything about it because it didn't have that much information online. But now that it's aired, of course, um, has a whole page and everything set up for it. And it's Gordon Ramsay-led cooking show. Um, and the whole gimmick of it is actually based on a Netflix series called The Platform of All Things, which is a foreign, or it's actually not a series, it's a movie, but it was on Netflix. Um, it's a Spanish, like, Bolivian movie or something um, that got a lot of critical praise. Um, I actually checked it out and it's pretty interesting. The whole gimmick in the movie was there were all of these individuals who were basically held captive. They were like all prisoners and there's this big sort of contraption that falls through all of these different uh, platforms essentially. That's where they get the name from and it has all this great food on it, right? They have a team of these, you know, high class world renowned chefs prepare this giant meal uh, for the morning and then throughout the day this platform goes up and down all these different layers and when it gets to the first floor you know the people on the top they can have whatever they want right they have the whole basically tray for them to just pick out whatever they want to eat for the day uh, but they only get you know a certain amount of time they only get like five minutes or so to eat and then it goes down to the next person and they get to pick what's next and then they get to the next person and they keep going and like in the movie there's like 200 different layers of them so when you're on the very bottom you know by that point there's nothing left and that's kind of the conflict of the movie um essentially meant to be like a commentary on you know classes and, and social classes the people that are on the top obviously have the best selection of everything the people on the bottom not so much so they kind of adopted this concept into a gordon ramsay cooking show of all things and on the show, there's three different kitchens that they have. The top one is super nice, super decked out, has the best equipment possible, has all these, you know, beautiful appliances, stainless steel, you know, uh, stoves and everything. It had like the top, you know, most expensive uh, products that you can use. And they get first pick of the platform, which goes up and down all three uh, with all the best ingredients, right? So they get the first crack of, you know, what ingredients they want to cook uh, to make their dishes. Then when it goes to the second level, it's more of just a standard, you know, commercial grade kitchen. It's not the best, but it's not the worst either. It's just kind of, you know, very average. And they get the second choice of what's left on the platform of the ingredients to cook. And then when it goes to the third level, that's when it gets really bad. You know, this is basically like a ghetto kitchen. There's really, really bad beat up equipment in there. There's not a lot of it, right? They really have to be very creative in how they're going to make this dish. And by the time the platform gets to the third level, the ingredients they have to select from are really bad. It's like, you know, all the crap stuff that the top two layers didn't want. So they just got to, you know, make it work, right? Essentially, that's the whole gimmick of it. So it's a pretty interesting concept. And it definitely, you know, feels tense, right? You feel for the people on the bottom because you really want them to succeed. And then the people on top, you're like, oh, you know, they're very greedy and stuff. You know, you kind of root against them. But in addition to that, it also kind of takes from The Voice as well on NBC. Uh, the gimmick on that show, of course, is that all the contestants audition and then the different coaches, as they say, will kind of mentor them throughout the show. 
And then when they go to perform, it'll be like, you know, oh, you did well because you were under Blake Shelton's, you know, mentorship or whatever. And then they'll compete against each other um, in the competition. And on this show, it's the same idea. So they have Gordon Ramsay and then the other two judges. They all selected uh, the different contestants that they want on their team that they're going to mentor throughout the season. And essentially, it's going to be like, you know, whose uh, team is the best at, you know, kind of adopting their styles and, you know, listening to them as kind of these world-renowned chefs and kind of applying that to their own cooking and stuff. So it kind of takes, uh, you know, each element from some of the most popular uh, you know, mediums of the day and kind of implements them in a really creative way uh, to to make a cooking show that's really unlike anything else, you know. And um, I was really into it. Uh, Matt watches a lot of Gordon Ramsay cooking shows with me, so he was really into it. Our mom, you know, was pretty curious of it. And this is definitely something that I'm going to be checking out. I don't think I'm going to be watching this live, though, just because of the fact that it's on Wednesdays, and Wednesdays are really competitive. So they did the whole, you know, put out an episode beforehand to kind of promote the show and then give it its standard time, you know, later in the week. So it premiered on the second, which was a Sunday after um, the NFL game. So that gave it a boost in the ratings. And then now it's going to um, occupy its space on Wednesdays here, which is going to be kind of tricky because again, Wednesday is really competitive. They got the Chicago's, they got, um, you know, the C, uh, C, excuse me, CBS um, lineup as well, which is really popular. And then now they have Good Sam is going to be on there. And um, I'm going to be watching the Chicago's and Fox is going to have this as well. So it's going to be a competitive lineup for sure to see um, which ones outdo each other in the ratings. But anyways, that is the show for you guys today. That was the last show on my list there at Next Level Chef. Hope you guys did enjoy this one. Um, if you like this format where it's just kind of me, you know, casually going over these things, um, I didn't, you know, go too in depth with this one. Uh, didn't make like a, you know, presentation or anything. Just kind of had more of a casual vibe this episode. Um, let me know if this is something that you guys like to see because I really like doing it this way where I can just kind of, you know, put any thoughts I have and just kind of ramble on as well um, and then hear back from you guys of course always love to have discussions with you guys as well um, so let me know if that's something that you enjoy more or less than the other ones but as well be sure to like and subscribe of course like I said we got all sorts of great stuff coming in the near future more episodes of the podcast tournaments big collabs big big projects that we are super excited to share with you guys definitely something that you want to look forward to here just as much as you want to look forward to all these great tv shows as well here uh with that hope you guys have a great rest of your day thank you for watching and we will see you in the next one